guys, welcome to All Electronics. I'm Gregory, and in this video, we are talking about RF power measurement, especially about diode power detectors as we use it on the power meter project that is here on the bench. We're gonna go to the whiteboard to understand the circuit of the diode detector, and we're also gonna understand why a diode detector, why a non-linear device works as a power detector. So guys, how a diode detector works? How a power measurement system that uses diode detection really works? The basic problem of power measurement is the problem that we have a signal source that has an amplitude V, an output impedance Z, that is a constant, we hope it's a constant, and we want to connect a device here to detect the power available from this source here. We already studied here on the channel what is the available power of a signal source. Remember, this, all this box here is the signal source. For RF systems, the signal source has an output impedance of 5th ohm, or it's very close to 5th ohm. And in most cases, we want to measure the available power from this black box here. The available power will be delivered when we match the sensor, the load, of the power source with the same impedance. Actually, with the conjugate of the source impedance, but as we are talking about a, an RF system that we try to achieve fifth ohm, constant fifth ohm resistance, when we are talking, we can say that we need to match to the equal impedance because we know that it's fifth ohm and it is resistive. So we actually need that the power sensor behave like a fifth ohm load. So we are measure the true available power. So this impedance looking through the power sensor needs to be fifth ohm. With the condition of a fifth ohm input impedance in the power meter, we know that all the available power of the power source will be entering the power meter. And now that we know that if we connect the power sensor to the power source, all the available power will be delivered because we have a matched condition. If all the power is entering the power sensor, we have the opportunity of creating a circuit or creating or using a technique to measure this power. This power can be measured using a heating device that will heat the temperature will change, the temperature will increase, and this temperature rise is converted in a signal that can be displayed like 11 dBm as example. Or in the case of this power sensor here that uses a diode, we are not measuring the temperature rise in the power sensor. We are actually measuring the voltage over a load resistor. But what matters is that the task of the power sensor is to be sensible to the input power, the power entering the power sensor, and it needs to create an output signal that is proportional to it, that can be interpreted, that can be compared to a table, to a calibration table, so we know what is the power being delivered entering the power sensor. So what happens if we place here a diode and a capacitor. We know what this circuit here is. This is a rectifier. This is a very crude power sensor and we see this drawn a lot on the internet but it has a lot of flaws. First flaw, people think that it will be rectifying the input signal. So people look at this and imagine that this actually is really rectifying the signal. So if here you have a voltage waveform People really think that this is working as a common rectifier that is generating a DC potential here that can be compared to a calibration table to estimate the power being delivered here on the input. And we see this circuit actually being used. One very important thing that you're gonna understand in a moment is that this is not actually rectifying the signal as people think. It may be working on this very large signal behavior for very high input amplitude. But for low amplitudes, this does not happen. And people think about this. Our intuition is always to think in the large signal behavior. When you look something and when we try to estimate 
the behavior in our heads, we always think about the large signal behavior. At least when we are starting on, on electronics, we have this tendency of thinking on the large signal. So when people look to this circuit here, people think in the diode as a on and off switch. When the input voltage is higher than the voltage on the capacitor, this becomes a switch a closed switch that charges the capacitor. When the voltage is lower, the diode opens and the output holds the peak. And this is very important because if this was the main working behavior, this probe here would never, or any diode detector probe, would never measure very low input power. For low powers, the input voltage excursion here is much lower than the forward biasing voltage of a diode. But the probe still works. And this comes from the non-linear behavior of the small signal resistance of the diode. We're gonna see this in a moment. But first, let's see the other major flaws we have here in this circuit. First thing here is that we broke the assumption that the power sensor has a very well matched, a very well behaved input impedance. We connected the diode directly to the DUT, to the power source we, we want to measure. Of course, this is an unmatched condition. The power source will not be delivering the available power to this node here. The available power will not be flowing here. In this case here, we are going to have very low power being delivered here with a higher voltage excursion because the impedance here is very, very high. So the first thing we need to have in a broadband diode detector probe, and this is important. Why I'm saying broadband? Because for single frequencies, we may be able to match the diode impedance to the power source. We may be able to add here in the middle some kind of a matching network that would match this very high impedance of the diode, capacitive or inductive for higher frequencies, to the fifth ohm power source. But this would work only for one specific frequency and would require precise adjustments. So what we really need to do to have a power probe like this is to have a very good load resistance right at the input of the power probe. Why I draw here two resistors? Because actually I use it two resistors in this probe here, as we saw here on the channel in the videos about this. I actually use it two 100 ohm resistors here. And I use it two resistors because it was easier to create a fifth ohm load here, but more important, because more resistors in parallel help to create a broadband resistance. As this will reduce the inductances and all the inductive path that we have from this node to the ground. There are some designs that will even add here a resistive pad like a 3 dB pad or a 6 dB pad to improve even more the broadband matching condition of the power source through the power sensor. But if we use an attenuator topology like this one here, we are paying with dynamic range. We're gonna pay dissipating power on the pad resistor and this power dissipated here cannot be measured by the power sensor so we are directly paying with a decrease of dynamic range so we have this trade-off in my design here i directly place the resistors right on the sma connector of the power detector well you are seeing that the output voltage that we have here that is proportional to the input power and we are going to understand later why this happens but you are seeing that this voltage here is a DC level. And this happens because we are placing a boundary condition for the working of this diode here. This diode here is our nonlinear element. And as you're gonna see, the nonlinear element will generate new frequency content on the output. This is actually the task of the diode. We need to generate new frequency content on the output to be able to measure the power. And what's even more interesting, we are interested on the frequency component with zero hertz, the DC component. As the DC component here, this voltage level, is the only term we wanna see in the output of this nonlinear transfer function, we add here the capacitors to short all the higher frequency component terms 
that are generated by the nonlinear transfer function. Look at this, guys. We are understanding this circuit here from a total different point of view. We are not more talking about very large signal behavior, rectifying on and off. We are talking about nonlinear transfer function that will generate new frequency content on the output. And we need to short all the frequency components, leaving only the DC component that is a frequency term at zero hertz. So these capacitors here actually are very, very important. And they have a major contribution to the frequency response of the probe. This needs to be a very good short for all the frequencies, a broadband short circuit. The input resistance needs to be a broadband resistance and this capacitor needs to behave as a broadband short circuit to ground. So let's redraw it again. And guys, a quick pause. If you want to learn more about RF power measurements, the advantages and disadvantages of RF diode detectors, you can use the link in the description to take a look on the Keysight use cases website about RF power measurements. Keysight master a lot of different techniques for RF power measurements and they provide this very good application note about this that actually was one of my references when I was designing this RF probe here. Use the link in the description and take a look on the Keysight use case page about RF power measurements. What I actually did here for this power measurement probe is that I added more than one capacitor and this is a workaround for the resonance frequency of the capacitor we need to have here very near the diode the capacitor that is acting as a short for the higher frequency term so here we have 15 pico this will behave as a short for very high frequencies for the microwave range now we need to have a capacitor for the middle range frequency range of the sensor 100 pico and now we need to have a capacitor for filtering out for shorting to ground the low frequency components like a 2 nano 2 capacitor so using more than one capacitor and having the capacitor for the higher frequency components near the diode we optimize the system to have a short circuit to ground in a broadband fashion and what's important to understand guys is that in radio frequency we don't have a short circuit we can create we are able to create low impedances so if we plot the impedance here the impedance over frequency we are going to have something like this it's not zero we are not able to create a zero ohm but we are able to create very low impedance let's say here i don't know let's imagine here uh 0.2 ohm only for showing the idea and we have three resonant valleys because we have three capacitors each capacitor is resonating with its own series inductance and with the inductance of the diode so we even cannot think about this this side of the circuit interacting with this side of the circuit here when we add the non-linear behavior here in the middle we break all the assumptions about the linear model the inductor capacitive resistive model so what really matters is to think about the series inductances of the capacitors up to the diode junction and this is why we need to have the smaller capacitance near the diode because in this manner we preserve the high frequency resonance of the capacitor if we add this capacitor here we are going to have these inductances here that will be added to the series inductance of the capacitance and the series resonance of the capacitance would shift for to a lower frequency so this is why we have this step of values going from the smaller to the higher and of course guys we need to have a leakage resistance here to leak the charge of the capacitors slowly so we can update the voltage here if we change the input power here the voltage out output is updated if we don't have here and we assume that we don't have leakage on the circuit the capacitors will slowly charge and will hold a constant voltage here that would never be updated that would never change because the capacitors hold the charge hold the voltage here so we need to have a small leakage current here to create the opportunity for the output voltage signal to be updated as the input power source changes its power here so in my design i added here a 407k resistor. Now we have the basic diagram 
the basic topology of a diode power sensor. We have the broadband input resistance that is terminating the input to the correct impedance, creating the opportunity for the source to deliver all the available power, generating the correct voltage profile. So the voltage profile over this node here is the correct voltage profile of a matched condition. This voltage profile is sensed by the diode, by the non-linear function, and it creates new frequency components here on the output. So we have here amplitude and frequency, and we have a frequency component here on the zero hertz, and we are going to have other frequency components. We are only interested in the DC level, the output voltage, the zero hertz frequency component. So we need to add a very broad band short circuit for all the frequencies over zero hertz, and we do this with capacitors. So we add a filter here that will short to ground all the frequency components, leaving only the DC potential here that we can sense with an analog to digital converter compared to a calibration table to have the output power of the input. Well, what's missing here? We need to understand how the diode is generating a DC component there. How it's doing this if it's not working on this very large signal behavior here? How it works? We are back to our circuit, but I replaced the diode and I put it here a resistor. What would be the behavior of this circuit with a resistor here? This is a complete linear circuit and of course if we don't have any DC level here on the input we will not have any DC level here at the output. This is a low pass filter. RC forms a low pass filter that averages the signal in the input. If the signal is a voltage with a zero volt average, the output here is zero volts, zero volt average here. So of course this circuit here is not a good representation of the power probe. But what gonna happen if we consider that this resistor here in place of the diode is a non-linear resistor. It means that this resistance here changes. The resistive behavior of this resistor here changes. And this is actually the diode dynamic resistance. This is the diode dynamic resistance. And it is a variable resistor where this resistance here, RD, is a function from an overall perspective is a function of time. So this resistance here is actually a function of time. And this resistance here changes as a function of time because actually we have a voltage changing here as a function of time. We have the voltage here of the power source. Power source is developing a matched condition voltage here waveform over the load resistance. I draw it very distorted here, but it will be a very clean waveform. We can model the transfer function of a diode as here you have i and here you have v as an exponential okay and actually this dynamic resistance is the derivative of this curve here is the voltage over current so this resistance here is this derivative here and we see that for different voltages or currents in the diode the resistance is different what really happens here guys is that we have the voltage of the power source as the voltage increases here, the diode conducts a little more and its resistance becomes lower, okay? As the voltage decreases, the diode dynamic resistance becomes higher. So actually, the diode resistance, I switched the colors, but there's no problem. The diode resistance is actually, let's draw in a different plane here, plane. It is lower and higher, lower and higher, lower. Now we understand why I was talking about a non-linear transfer function. This circuit here is not working as a linear circuit. This is why new frequency components appear here on the output. And this is why a DC component appears here. And from the DC component perspective, it's very easy to understand that if this resistance is changing, when the voltage goes higher, 
the resistance goes low and we charge the capacitor more than when the voltage goes low. So we are always charging the capacitor a little more than we are discharging it. We have an imbalance of current. The current going to the capacitor is a little higher than the current going from the capacitor. This creates an imbalance of current and we create a very low DC current. The net current is DC in that direction. When this net current encounters the leakage resistance here, it creates a DC potential here on this node. This is fascinating guys, this is very fascinating. If we increase the power of the source, the voltage profile here will be higher this modulation will be higher and we're gonna operate in a higher slope here of the diode transfer function. The voltage here will increase. So now we have a DC potential that is proportional to the input power of the power source. And this modulation effect happens for very tiny voltage swings here, for very low powers. For micro volts of swing here, we can have this modulation effect and create a DC potential here. So this is not exactly a small signal circuit here because it is still being modulated. This resistance is dynamic over time. But here I think we can use the term small signal in this not in, not in the sense that we are linearizing the circuit in a bias point, but in the sense that we are not working in the large signal behavior of the diode when we think about the diode in the on and in the off state. Of course, if we increase to very, very high powers here, like 0 dBm, 1 dB, 2 dB, now we're gonna enter a little in the large signal behavior where the diode really starts to behave like a switch because we are applying a very, very, very high voltage here. So actually the power to voltage conversion has a kink. This is very fascinating. The input power in dBm to voltage conversion is a curve like this one. And we can imagine that it has two regions here. This region and this region. Around this point here, around this point, this is a, an approximation, around this point we are transitioning from this small signal mod resistance modulation effect to a larger signal behavior where the resistance starts to become very low and very high and we start to think about the diode as a switch. And this is it, now we understand how a diode power detector works. Well guys, I hope you liked this video, if so subscribe to the channel and give it a thumbs up. And remember to take a look on the Keysight use case page about RF power measurements, link in the description. I see you in the next video of All Electronics.